India has promised the world that it would go net zero by the year 2070. Therefore, it has become crucial for India Inc. to be at the forefront of sustainability drive. With this agenda as the centerpiece, CNBC TV18 and Schneider Electric's Green Yodha hosted the sustainability roadmap towards a greener economy. The event was kicked off by an opening address by CNBC TV18's Delhi Bureau Chief, Parikshit Luthra. Welcome to this very uh, special event, CNBC TV18 and Schneider Electric bring to you the Green Yodha Initiative, the sustainability roadmap towards a greener economy. At COP26, India's 2030 decarbonization target was announced. The Prime Minister had announced the Panch Amrit of five climate goals. India now stands committed to reduce emissions intensity of its GDP by 45%. 50% cumulative electric power installed capacity from non-fossil fuel-based energy sources and 500 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2030. Now on popular demand, the difference between carbon neutrality and net zero. Carbon neutrality means that you can compensate for your emissions, typically with offsets, while net zero requires abatement of your emissions. Now I was told that this is a term that will come up very frequently in the conversations, and we must explain this to our audience, even though I think all of you are experts here. You don't need any advice and no explaining. In his special address, Deepak Sharma, Zone President, Greater India MD and CEO of Schneider Electric India, shared Schneider Electric's perspective on the sustainability roadmap. The moment of India has come where we are actually on a very important part on the global roadmap or the global focus where India is going to ride the next phase of the growth, growth economy and, and digitization. So it's a very great moment for all of us to witness that we are in a country at the right time or in the right phase when we play an important role across the world. Now, we would be a five trillion economy by 27, 28, probably a more six trillion economy by 2030. That would would mean we would need much more urbanization. The data shows that almost 60 crores, 600 million people of us would be in urban cities. Our needs of data center, I say corrected, probably is going to more 3x than 2x. Amount of uh, industrialization we will do, we would be adding almost 500 billion plus businesses across the globe. Uh, one of or most of our global cities will be growing faster than the global uh, bigger cities. And our infrastructure spend would be adding another by 3 to 5x. This is all exciting to the journey we want to build in this country. We at the Schneider Electric are super proud that a couple of, and some of our big installations are in this country are powered by Schneider Technologies, be it the metros, the airports, the hospitals, the buildings, the, the green buildings, all the revolutions or the green stories we are talking about are actually helping us to build a greener infrastructure and, and, and with all this, we are very proud that with all the government support and we are a strong partner in building a tomorrow, which is going to be green in all the punch, uh, all the different initiatives the government is taking to build a sustainable tomorrow. So again, thank you for coming. I'm looking forward for more conversations together and a deeper in interaction that how do we involve each other participation to build tomorrow, which is going to be more greener, more sustainable, through technologies available, so that we leave a planet behind us, which is going to be usable for our generations to come. Thank you for coming again, and looking forward to some good discussions in the coming hours. Thank you. Deepak Sharma's address was followed by a power-packed panel discussion titled, The Sustainability Roadmap Towards a Greener Economy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening. It must have been a very, very long day. Uh, for all of you at work, it's a Friday evening. Thank you very much to all our panelists, uh, Ms. Vibha, and everyone in the audience for joining us today. It really is a very important uh, occasion and topic as well, our energy transition. We're seeing businesses across the world working towards sustainability, working towards ESG norms, greater compliances across businesses and cutting emissions. And we've had a number of these conversations over the last seven to eight months, uh, and especially in the run-up to COP28, there'll be more such conversations. But clearly, this is no longer a, a goal or a greater good that we need to work for. It is, it, it makes all the business sense. And as a news anchor, over the last few weeks, 
we've seen so many climate disasters and it makes you really think that we need to all think about it. And one thing that I'll ask all the panelists is what we need to do as citizens as well. There's a lot that we can do as industry, uh, we can do as government, but as citizens also, we need to change our own mindsets. So I'm not the one who should be doing too much talking. I'm going to kick this panel discussion off. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Deepak Sharma at this stage. Uh, Deepak, that was a great presentation by you, giving us a sense of what Schneider Electric is doing with its partners across the world. Uh, I'd like you to give us a sense and explain our audience. You've got some major big players, multinationals, who know what they want to do, what they need to do when it comes to sustainability. But a company which is starting off, how do they make sure that they move towards a journey, a journey of greater compliances, reducing carbon emissions, but at the same time ensure progress? So thank you again. Uh, probably uh, it's one of the most important points. How do we start? Where do we start? And uh, we normally talk about you know, defining a strategy What's our next five-year strategy? Next, what is our next 10-year strategy? And then in the strategy, we say, what is the sustainability piece of it, right? I think that that era is over. There is nothing called strategy and sustainability. There is only one strategy, which is sustainable strategy. Uh, because imagine that you, you won't have a planet, so all the strategies you're going to define, they have of no use, because you don't know how to and where to implement them. So sustainability comes, I think, as a core part of our, our stories, whatever we do. And, uh, and then comes, okay, let's, we have defined a strategy which is sustainable. This is going to what we achieve. And the beauty is, it's no more a vanity metric. It actually becomes like a sanity metric, right? How do we ensure it happens? Uh, Mr. Gupta, if I were to ask you, Yota launched its data center in Noida last year, and data centers are known to be power guzzlers. Give us a sense of how you are making sure that your facility is using world-class technology when it comes to reducing emissions across operations. Thank you. So first of all, just to give a perspective, many people possibly now that's not the case that you may not know data centers, but this is a word we start buzzing our lives ever since digital came in our lives. 3% uh, of the world electricity actually is, going, is actually getting consumed only by a few buildings in the world which are data centers. Uh, that scenario is now happening in India as well. It happened in Singapore because that is the country which had got a big part of the data center of the whole APEC. Uh, the energy consumption and the resultant heat generation and the pollution increased so much that they had to put a moratorium on the data center construction in 2019, which they uh, took out just now. And even now they are saying the, a bubbling industry which data center was there that now they can build only very small, and that also 100% powered by uh, a green power only. So, and again, just to give you an idea that one data center building can consume a power which is equivalent to almost 30 to 40 commercial residential buildings. So it's a serious problems which need to be handled. A good part in India, whether it's Yota or anybody, is that we started late. While the mature markets now have got aging data centers, it's very difficult to do, undo something which is already done and only they can do for new data centers. In India, this industry started growing uh, just in the last seven or eight years. We already have, as industry, become four times bigger uh, and possibly will become another four times bigger in the next seven to eight years. But uh, Anshuman, if I were to come to you, and I'll put this question to uh, Mr. Qatar as well. Uh, Anshuman, beginning with you, when it comes to buildings and construction, what are some of the steps that lead to the highest amount of emissions? Uh, first of all, you know, I just want to mention what Deepak said. We are number five globally as a country contributing to whatever global warming or climate change. This is when what we expect so much development and urbanization. So we're expecting 150 to 200 million square feet of office space to be built in the next three years. 90 million square feet of warehousing would come in the next three years. Millions of square feet of housing, retail, healthcare, and the entire urbanization where maybe more than 100 million people will shift from rural to urban areas. So for us to remain at number five, itself will be an achievement. You know, I'm, I'm sure we'll move up, unfortunately, that uh, number which we should not. So a huge amount of work has to be done. 
uh, to your question, you know, what is the contribution? I mean, uh, obviously energy is the main uh, uh, contributor. And there was a stats you, sh you had put about 30, 29%, I had a stat of 35%, is the contribution of buildings and construction uh, in energy consumption and uh, thing, which is, even if it is 30%, it's one third. So buildings and construction are major contributors. Right. Uh, Mr. Cutter, coming to you, as uh, Anshuman was pointing out, it's a complicated process. They've, you've got an entire value chain. Now, when it comes to reducing emissions across your value chain, which are some of the low-hanging fruit and some of the difficult areas which are challenging for companies like yours to uh, reduce emissions in the construction and building sector? So I'll start with the challenges first. I think the biggest challenge is to be persevering and to be at it all the time. I think that's the biggest challenge. I think Deepak just mentioned that it's a strategy, but it has to percolate down to the bottom of the pyramid, and that's most important. In terms of what can be done uh, to do the uh, biggest factor contributing to emissions is energy. And uh, there is lots that can be done there. I think from a, from a national point of view, uh, moving to renewable energy is great, but I think we need tremendous levels of power reforms to be able to achieve uh, what we are looking to do. Uh, the, uh, it's energy on one side, it is uh, water conservation on the other, it is waste management on the third. The other major contributor to it is transportation. And unless we move to either public transportation or electric movement transportation, we will continue to add to the emissions. Uh, once these two are managed, at least from a point of view of the business that I am in, uh, we are able to control more than 90% of the carbon emissions. That's good to hear. And uh, of course, some of the steps that you're uh, talking about are being taken by the government in terms of uh, electrifying transport. But there too, there are some challenges with regard to charging infrastructure and uh, technology as well. But uh, Mr. Jepuriar, to get you in, uh, you were telling us a short while back, and it's widely known, that uh, the, the Delhi airport is already carbon neutral. You're working towards going net zero by 2030. Give us a sense of how you have achieved your uh, carbon neutral goals, and what are some of the next steps you would be taking in the next five to 10 years? Thank you. So uh, it's not only that we are net uh, uh, we are looking for net zero, but in terms of all the green practices, I think we are leading across the world in terms of many of the practices. In fact, Delhi Airport is rated as one of the highest, has got one of the highest acquisition with Airport Council International at 4.0 transition, and we were the second airport in the world to actually get it. And how we have done it is that we have embedded it into our day-to-day -day work. So if I can describe it in short, I can say there are eight pillars on which basically our initiatives are standing. So first of all, you have to improve upon the efficiency of energy uses. And for that, whether it is changing everything into including the runway lights into uh, 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 more energy efficient lights, to working with airlines to provide them with taxi bot, which basically reduces their auxiliary power unit, and many other initiatives that we have worked on. Next is about putting it into the building itself. So all the infrastructure that we have developed in the past, as well as we are developing now, we have got pre-certified green building. Like Terminal 1, which is getting completed right now, is already pre-certified green building platinum. Elephant in the room is water. Because we are taking water for granted. Mr. Ashok Kumar, 
I'd like to get in the government experience here. The reason why I came to you after listening to all other industry members is to just understand what is the Prime Minister's larger vision when it comes to clean energy and government industry roadmap for achieving our uh, global COP commitments. And the Ganga Conservation Mission, a very challenging and mammoth task. Give us a sense of the kind of challenges you have to overcome on a daily basis and the kind of collaboration you're looking from the industry on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, um, I was listening to the other panelists, uh, many of them speaking on the electricity. Uh, but the, I would say the elephant in the room is water. Because we are taking water for granted and all other things will survive only if there is water for people to drink. So water is very important. That's exactly why our Prime Minister had been stressing on water and water management for the last eight years. So um, uh, <coughs> again, I'll go back to that data center, panelists on data center. They actually are as a new sector and it is, India can leapfrog a lot of technology, but for us, it is an established practice because maximum water in India is used for agriculture purposes, and there's a traditional way of kind of giving irrigation, uh, flood irrigation, and inefficient use of water, and that practice has to be changed. So, see here, the challenge in uh, water in India sector is we have to actually uh, uh, overturn a very many years of, of uh, legacy uh, practices, as well as give, make people understand the value of water. That's one of the major challenges. Now, that exactly is what uh, the Honorable Prime Minister uh, started when in 2014 he started with the uh, uh, Swachh Bharat mission, because water security has two important aspects, the quantity aspect as well as the quality aspect. Now, water quantity, uh, see, the rain comes uh, um, the, every year, the rain comes, and then that it has been constant for over, over the years. Last hundred years, rainfall pattern is the uh, same. The, the, the intensity of rainfall has varied, but the quantity of rain which comes in every day, every year is the same. So, um, but uh, this good quantity of water which comes in can be spoiled by dirty water coming in. So, um, Liters of good water can be spoiled by a few liters of dirty water. So that's why when we started the Swachh Bharat mission, it was actually to ensure that the toilets are provided to the people so that the openification is avoided. And that really prevented a lot of contamination coming into the drinking water source. So that's one major important. Second, realizing the importance of water, he came out with the uh, uh, Ministry of Jal Shakti to combine all the uh, various ministries handling water together. So that's, these are two major interventions. Right. That's a very important point. Final thoughts, sir? Yeah. So commitment from our side is that we should, that we will always be ahead of the curve in terms of the airport sector in sustainability. So our commitment for this year is that by the end of the year, we will be water positive because we already have got enough of rainwater harvesting pits and there are 300 more which are coming. So with that, we are going to be 108% of water. And by 2030, a net zero carbon airport. Right, uh, and Mr. Sharma, one commitment from you, very, uh, in, a, in a brief, uh, uh, brief 10 to 15 seconds. So f I'll make two. First, we want to expand this Green Yodha initiative. We want all of us to come and pledge something for the bigger cause because we believe this is going to be solvable when all the ecosystem awakes. From a personal corporate perspective, we have already committed to be a carbon neutral operations by 25. Uh, we are working on a plan uh, with our top 1,000 uh, suppliers uh, to decarbonize them, 50% of their operations by 25, 60 of them are global suppliers in India, and of course we have made a pledge to be carbon neutral company by 2040, so that's the pledge we have taken. Right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on this panel discussion, lots to think about, and thank you very much everyone in the audience. The event concluded with an address by the guest of honor, Director General Terry. Vibhadhavan on leveraging technology to achieve energy efficiency. Thank you and good evening to all of you. So much has been said about the need for going green and net zero and so on. So it's really difficult for me now. The script which I got with me, I thought everything was talked about.
So I really have to speak without it and rather what I, I feel are coming from the heart. Well, it goes without saying that sustainability is the mantra if the human race wants to survive on this planet. Students at all levels, they must be taught about sustainability. They must be taught about that we cannot afford the way we are living today. And at the back of our mind, we should always keep, you and I perhaps can tolerate if there is a flood or any loss, but for poor people, it is loss of a generation because they'll again become much poorer and one more generation perhaps will miss going to school. So thank you very much. <laughs>